This is the tail of the snail and the worm. The various freshwater snails are probably among the most familiar creatures in our ponds, especially the great pond snail with its long pointed shell and the ramtorn snail with its spiral shaped shell, reminiscent of ammonite fossils. These snails mostly feed on algae, living and decaying plants, but will also eat dead animals and eggs, including those of other snails, and even live invertebrates if they can catch them, basically anything edible they can get in their mouths. This one, for example, is feeding on the egg cocoons of water fleas. Some less familiar pond residents are the freshwater annelids, the true worms, aquatic relatives of the soil dwelling earthworms. But there are also much smaller worms, such as the naiad worms, some of which can be almost microscopic in size. Most of these worms live in the sediment and detritus at the bottom of the pond, where they typically feed on decay matter they find there. But there is one species with a different niche. It lives with, on, and as we'll discuss later, sometimes in snails. If you're able to take a close look at a snail from your local pond or ditch, there's a good chance you'll see some white, somewhat transparent worms, less than 1 to 5 millimetres in length. These are Ketiogaster limnaei, a type of true annelid worm. It has done something few other worms have, and forms an association with another type of animal. In this case, the pond snails. It lives on the body and inside the shell and mantle of a number of pond snail species, which includes the greater pond snail and the great ramshorn snail, and occasionally can be found on freshwater mussels. They move around on the snail freely and are described by many sources as living commensally with it, living on the snail while not harming it. From the snail they reach out and grab small organisms like rotifers, algae and single-celled animals to eat and they get a steady supply of food as the snail moves along, as you can see here. They can reproduce by laying eggs in a cocoon, but typically they reproduce asexually by budding. The worm narrows at one point along the body and splits into two worms. Their numbers are lowest in winter, but increase in spring, with the numbers on each snail in one study rising from below 10 to over 50 by late spring. These worms are rarely found away from snails, and usually spread when snails come into contact with each other, which is often when they are mating. Of course, if their snail host is eaten by a predator, they will jump ship, and they will need to find another host. They do this by sensing the chemicals and mucus in the water coming from a snail, and move towards them to try and find a new host. They can also sense snail egg masses, enabling them to colonise young snails when they hatch. They prefer areas of lower light levels, so you can often find them aggregating under the shell margin and tentacles of the snails. This relationship between the worm and the snail has been described as mutualistic, as a snail may get some benefits. As these snail dwelling worms have been shown to eat the larvae of trematoparasites that infect the snail. One study showed that those snails carrying these worms were only half as likely to become infected as those that didn't have the worms. They have been shown in one study to reduce the infection rates of one of the most infamous trematodes, the liver fluke. They use snails as a host for part of their life cycle, but only 13.3% of the snails that are playing host to our little snail worms became infected, while 70% of the snails without worms did get infected with the flukes. The next part of the liver fluke's life cycle, after infecting the snail, can result in them infecting mammals, including sheep and us humans. So these worms not only help the snails, but potentially us and our animals. Though whether they have any actual meaningful effect in the wild is unclear. Overall, they seem to help the snails, at least with these parasites. But in some cases, the relationship may be parasitical. The worms have been seen stealing food from the snails, and the snails of smaller species, with large numbers of these worms, were shown to grow slower than those without. And there's an even darker side to this relationship, as the worms we've been talking about so far are just one subspecies. There is a second subspecies of Ketiogaster limnii that enters the snail and lives as an internal parasite in the snail's kidney as an endoparasite, eating the cells of that organ. But overall, for the larger pond snails, with the subspecies that lives outside its body, rather than in its kidneys, seems to cause the snails little if any bother, and may even help prevent it getting infected with parasites. Whatever the case, it's another great example of the amazing creatures and the wonderful interactions going on between them in our ponds.